Parmar. I am the principal investigator for the subject of women's studies and today I am presenting to you module 23 from the paper on women and health which is paper number 8. This module is entitled Gender and Health Systems and it's been written by Professor T.K. Sundari Ravindran uh, from the Achyuta Menon Center for Health Science Studies in Trivandrum. Why look at gender in health systems? Men and women are conditioned according to the prevailing gender norms of society. Consequently, their perceptions and definitions of health and ill health are also conditioned and are likely to be different from each other. Their behavior and attitude towards good health is also different, as are the ways through which they access health care. These differences have been confirmed by a number of studies from South Asia. For example, in comparison to men, women often do not even recognize the symptoms of a health problem. And even when they do, they do not treat it as serious or warranting medical help. Often, they do not even perceive themselves as entitled to invest in their own well-being. There are several hurdles that women face when trying to get medical help that are related to gender. According to the NFHS 3, which is the National Family Health Survey, 47% women reported the following problems in accessing health care. One, concern that no woman doctor or female health provider was available. Two, not wanting to go alone to a clinic or hospital. Three, having to take transport alone when the medical facility is at a distance. Four, permission not given by the family. And five, getting money from the household for treatment. Therefore, we need to look at first what exactly is the health care structure in our country that people have to depend on when they need medical care, health information and guidance, and second, how women friendly is it? So what is a health system? According to the World Health Organization, uh, in 2007, they defined it as a health system consists of all organizations, people and actions whose primary intent is to promote, restore or maintain health. Thus, a health system is not just a collection of government hospitals and health centers delivering services, but includes all of the following, government and private hospitals, legislations for occupational safety, medical schools and paramedical training centers, and even families caring for a sick person at home. In order to aid efforts at strengthening health systems, the World Health Organization developed a framework consisting of six health system building blocks. These building blocks are one, service delivery, two, health workforce, three, information, four, medical products, vaccines and technologies, five, financing, and six, leadership and governance. The first one, let us look at how 
gender differences can and should be incorporated in the delivery of service. Deciding, first of all, the range and the content of services. There are a number of health conditions which affect men and women differently and may have to be managed differently. Therefore, differentials because of sex and gender and the needs of different age groups of the population have to be kept in mind when addressing the question of the range and content of health services. For example, women outlive men in most societies and therefore the health problems of elderly women should be included in the services provided at the primary care level. Depression is more common in women and substance use among men. Malaria is more prevalent among men, but the health consequences for pregnant women who get malaria are far more serious and potentially even fatal. Women who have suffered a stroke have greater pre and post stroke disability and greater mental impairment as compared to men. These differences need to be kept in mind. And besides these, the health needs of generally underserved groups such as older persons or adolescents or transgender groups also need to be addressed organization and modes of service delivery. Organization and modes of service delivery also need to be aware and respond to the differences between men and women in roles, in responsibilities, and in their ability to get medical help. When medical help is available close to home, or workplace and can provide a range of services promptly, it can be really effective in treatment and cure. Separate places and timings for women, men and young people makes medical help and services more acceptable to them. Patient provider interactions. It is very important that providers of health care be mindful of gender-based disadvantages of women patients. They should give both support and the correct information to patients so that they can make their own decisions. They should be careful to avoid gender stereotyping and be alert and sensitive to signs and symptoms of gender-based violence. They should try and ensure patient safety at all times. Point number two, the second building block of health systems is health workforce. For gender mainstreaming the health workforce, at least three areas have to be focused on. A, Creating a bias-free working environment for health workers. B, training health workers to be aware and sensitive about gender. And C, recognizing the unpaid health work done by women caregivers. Going back to A, in creating a gender bias-free working environment for health workers, health workers who are expected to have bias-free and empowering interactions with patients also require a working environment which is supportive and positive to them. Women health workers at all levels, from physicians to community health workers, are constrained by gender inequalities within society. For example, women physicians 
who have to balance their domestic and professional responsibilities often resolve this by choosing specialities or positions that are less demanding of their time. In the bargain, they lose out in their careers and seldom reach the top. Nurses and community health workers face the same situation. Nursing has been stereotyped as an occupation secondary to the role of the doctor and concerned chiefly with caring, nurturing and menial tasks. In a study from Pakistan, women health workers claimed that they faced multiple disadvantages. These were hierarchical management, disrespect from men colleagues, lack of family support, and hostility from the community. They reported that these frustrations negatively impacted their interaction with their patients. The training of health workers is vital for making health services more gender responsive. But this very important area has not received the policy and political support it deserves, and efforts are fragmented and under-resourced. Concerted action is needed for the training of health managers and health workers at all levels, prioritizing those who interact with patients on a daily basis. Very important to recognize the contribution and reduce the burden of unpaid and invisible health work. Unpaid health work is the informal care provided to an unwell or disabled person by a member of the same household or community or by a friend without any financial compensation. Now the burden of unpaid health work is likely to be the highest in low-income households that cannot afford paid home care and may also have a higher incidence of illnesses and long-term disability. Providing care for long-term illnesses increases women's burden of domestic responsibilities many-fold. For example, just to give you an idea, caring for an HIV patient at home may require fetching up to 24 additional buckets of water to wash the sick person, clean the soil sheets, wash dishes, and prepare food. Action is needed on a number of fronts to recognize and lessen the unequal burden of unpaid health care shouldered by women. Special interventions are needed that address the specific needs of caregivers and provide them with emotional and social support. One way this can be done is meeting with others who are in a similar situation. The third block is information. Information is a vital tool for establishing gender equality in all areas, including that of health. The limited availability of good quality data on health, disaggregated by sex and age, has been a major obstacle to gender responsive planning and policy making. Without knowing in what dimension of health and within which population subgroups disadvantages exist, there is no way to begin redressing gender or other inequities in health. The availability of integrated data that enabled the linking of health outcomes to social determinants make it possible to analyze what are the underlying gendered factors that cause health inequalities. 
the urgency of collection, analysis, and publication of data disaggregated by sex and age cannot be overemphasized. Fourth, medical products, vaccines, and technologies. The availability and affordability of drugs. The World Health Organization implemented its action program on essential drugs in 1981. This was an initiative to promote the availability of drugs and supplies to meet the priority health needs of the population. The essential drug list includes generic drugs which are between up to 50 to 70 percent cheaper than brand name drugs. There are important differences between men and women in health problems and needs. Essential drug lists have therefore to include drugs, vaccines and supplies to meet these different needs available at affordable prices and in adequate quantities. Non-availability or high cost of drugs at primary care levels causes economic hardship to patients who may have to buy their drugs and supplies in the private market. And this is likely to impact women more than men. Differences in responses to drugs and vaccines. Drugs act differently in women and men because of biological differences in body weights and fat composition, hormonal differences and differences in metabolism. There may also be differences arising from disparities in diet and exercise, smoking and consumption of alcohol. Differences have been documented between boys and girls in responses to a number of vaccines for infectious diseases, for example, measles and hepatitis B. So this calls for inclusion of women in adequate numbers in all clinical trials for drugs and vaccines. In terms of service delivery, awareness of the differences between women and men in responses to drugs is important in deciding on choice of drugs as well as the appropriate dosages. Uh, Shakila, to give you an example, is now 65 years old and had a heart attack 10 years ago. She prefers going to the nearby pharmacy, even if it costs more, than going to the hospital and waiting in the line for hours to get her medication. The downside to this alternative is that for financial reasons, Shakila is not buying a sufficient amount of medication and therefore not taking the prescribed dose. I know I should be taking my medication every day, but this way I can also save some money for my grandchildren. They are young and have a future, she argues. The fifth block is the finances. Health systems in most developing countries are financed by a mix of financial mechanisms. Usually there is a basic package of services financed by tax revenue and free at the point of service delivery. Costs of other health services have to be met by OOP or out of pocket payment or through a combination of different types of health insurance. In some countries, there are in addition social protection schemes which provide free services 
or even cash incentives for use of specific health services. These are targeted at population groups identified as vulnerable, like low income groups, indigenous populations, and mothers and children. So a health system that is financed mainly through out-of-pocket OOP expenditure, as in the case of India, impacts negatively on the ability to seek health care by those without access to cash, a majority of who are women. Reducing the proportion of health expenditure from out-of-pocket payment would make a would be a first step in gender mainstreaming health financing. As a result of gender power inequalities, OOP payments prevent more women than men from utilizing essential health services. Keeping the above mentioned points in mind, reducing out of pocket payments to the barest minimum should be a primary objective in mainstreaming gender in health financing. Where insurance is a major mode of financing health systems, special attention should be paid to coverage of women. Partially or fully subsidizing premium payments for those who cannot afford to pay and being aware that women, even when they belong to better off households, may fall within this category would be important. Making households as the unit of enrollment in insurance schemes would help extend insurance coverage to women and other household members with low decision making powers and financial resources. An example of a health system that is financed gender equitably is from Brazil. Brazil has what is called a unified health system, SUS, offering comprehensive and free health services for everybody. Created in 1988 within the new constitution, the SUS is based on principles of universal coverage, equity, and integrated care. SUS covers medical care at all levels, and services are provided by an extensive network of public and accredited private providers and facilities. A wide range of medicines are also provided free of cost. The SUS is fully financed by public sources. So, 55% comes from the federal government, 22% comes from district governments, and 23% comes from municipal governments, making it 100. It covers a wide range of women's health care services, including prenatal care, delivery and postpartum care, breast and cervical cancer screening, STD care, adolescent and menopausal care, treatment of reproductive tract infections, infertility service, family planning education, and contraceptive products. Women and adolescents of all ages are covered by these services. The SUS appears to be effective in providing financial protection to women seeking safe delivery services. For example, a 2004 study of all births in that year found that less than 1% of all mothers had to incur any out-of-pocket expenses for meeting cost of delivery care. The last block is leadership and governance. Although women form 75% of the health workforce in many countries, they are underrepresented 
in managerial and decision-making positions in the health sector. Underrepresentation of women in leadership may inadvertently result in a lack of attention to women's specific health concerns and to a lack of appreciation of the specific problems and challenges faced by women in the health workforce. Women leaders in academic medicine in many parts of the world have been at the forefront of championing gender equity in health through public advocacy, research on gender issues in health, and advocating for integrating gender and women's health in the curriculum of health professionals. Gender equality in leadership in academic medicine is an important concern, as is a better representation of women in policy-making committees and boards. The active involvement of the women's movement and civil society institutions is also essential, and not just to ensure that policies are engendered. Without the continued involvement and independent monitoring by these actors, the chances are high for gender equality policies to evaporate or simply disappear as they are never seriously pursued and frequently given a quiet burial. Conclusions. Achieving gender equality in health requires attention to gender-based barriers to health care that women and men may face. While many of these barriers are at the level of the household and community, there are many things that a health system can do to help overcome them. This module describes the nature of gender-based barriers and also proposes ways in which these may be addressed by gender mainstreaming health systems. The changes proposed can indeed be achieved with political will and commitment to take forward the gender equity agenda, as well as pressure from civil society for gender responsive health systems. Gender inequality is not a problem that has no solution. Ultimately, political commitment and determination at the highest levels of international agencies and national governments are required to end gender inequality and empower women. Thank you.